Hello, and welcome to my program Elder, on Elderhood, Elderhood Aging Gracefully. My name is Larry A. Grimm, Larry Grimm, and I am happy to be a part of this with Think Tank Hawaii, giving an opportunity for us to look at elderhood as a, as a stage of life and to make it real and to make it wonderful. I am uh, two years on the island of Oahu, and it has been quite an adventure, quite a journey for me. I'm so thrilled to be here. I wish you Aloha Friday today, getting ready for the weekend, and people are very happy to welcome it and prepare for it on Aloha Friday. Uh, I, uh, Hawaii is an amazing place. It's a wonderful, wonderful state, and it's a fantastic um, paradise to live in. <clears throat> um, beauty surrounds us, and uh, and it's a great place. It's so very attractive that it is number one place in the United States for retirement. And that's part of what I'm about. Since I've been here in Hawaii, I have for the past two years been working, had the privilege of working with uh, Bristol Hospice Hawaii as one of their chaplains. I served as a chaplain in, in uh, Colorado, also in hospice care and long-term care. Also, I've been a Presbyterian minister in congregational life. So I've worked with elders all my life, all my career. And in that working with elders, I have come to the point of saying that we, at this stage of life, deserve a context in which to understand who we are, how we're working, how we're living. And I call it elderhood. We had childhood. We had our youth. We had adulthood. And now we have our elderhood. And I'm a stage thinker, and the way I think about the way we move through life and mature is that we have stage issues or stage tasks that come up for us in our consciousness. And today, I would like to go deeper into those stages with you because um, it's going to provide a framework for my whole program, for my whole show, as I move from week to week or as we start in September to week to, the, to every other week, starting on Tuesdays in September 17. So I want you to have that framework for understanding uh, the basic way in which I, I, I serve, uh, I understand elderhood, the basic way in which I also do personal coaching, personal life coaching for people going through elderhood. To give an opportunity to really process some of these tasks that rise up and present themselves for us to take on. So I want to look at those tasks in just a few minutes here. But before I do, I'd like to read a few phrases that um, are indications of why this time of life has a distinctive character and quality about it. My very good friend on the island here, um, uh, Buzz Tennant, just turned 65, and on the eve of his birthday, he wrote these words, among other words, that I'd, he said I could share with you. You've entered that fabulous nether region, often euphemistically referred to as the glorious, colorful, and slightly eccentric golden years. As a newly minted, particularly as a certified wheezing geezer of the male gender, you know how you now have the ability to choose your path. Namely, to continue living your life with characteristic passion and enthusiasm, doing what you love, following your bliss, growing and evolving with grace, acceptance, and humor, or bow down to the inevitable diminution of mind, body, and spirit in a complacent state akin to withering on the vine as the protagonist in the Shawshank Redemption laments. If you're not busy living, you're busy dying. So Buzz indicates that 65 has triggered in him an awareness that there's something new in his life that's about to happen, and he has a choice. It's an either-or choice for him at this point. Complacence uh, and, and uh, the, the diminution of the body, or to continue with the strength and the fervor and the joy and the enthusiasm of living the life that he has been accustomed to living. 
I offer also some, a few statistics that indicate why this is a particularly important thing for, to pay attention to in our lives, especially here in Hawaii. In June, the Hawaii Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism released some data from the 2018 state and county population characteristics. According to this group, the state's elderly population, those over 65, grew 33.7% between April 1st, 2010 and July 1st, 2018. Uh, this was an average growth over those eight years of 3.6% annually, 3.6%. It also it comprised 18.4% of the total population of Hawaii, or 260,000 residents of, of Hawaii, which is really about a quarter of the population. It means about a quarter of our population is over 65. And we're all in looking for ways to utilize the resources that are available to us in the most effective way. 260,000 residents in 2018, and that made Hawaii the seventh largest uh, aging po uh, elder population um, in the United States and District of Columbia. So why is attention worthy of this? Why is, uh, is this age group, why is this stage of life worthy of our conscious attention? It's also economic issues. Medical spending over the last year of an American's life averages $59,000. Now 71% of that is paid for by Medicare, 10% paid for by Medicaid, and the outstanding 20% paid for by personal funds. That can be either personal funds from wealth accumulated, or it can be personal funds from, uh, uh, from insurance policies for long-term care type policies. There's a tremendous amount of money that goes into elder care, people over the age of 65, and the resources, again, are, are uh, available to us, and we'll look at the, how those resources are available and how they can be expended. The most important or the most um, costly piece in elder care is facility costs. And people can spend from $66,000, $77,000 a year uh, for places to live, and that depends upon the quality of environment the type of care, the quality of care. So there's money that's being invested in our aging elderhood. There's time that's being invested in elderhood and uh, resources and training of people to provide uh, support and care. I maintain that these spiritual tasks sort of rise up in our lives. They rise up, and it happens in every stage of life, in childhood, in youth, adulthood. All of, as we move through those stages of life, there were demands on us that we had to resolve, things about our psyche and personality and our uh, clarity of who we are, identity issues. Well, those, there is also a certain number of, I mean, a certain task that I've identified just in my observation that also arise for us, and they are worthy of our attention. We need to pay attention to them. And that's what I'd like to focus on today, as I set the groundwork, a kind of foundation for all that I do in my caregiving. Now, I do use them as I go through my chaplaincy work, but I also use them as I provide uh, individual online, uh, online coaching professional coaching for life and faith, I call it. And it's an opportunity to deal with each of these spiritual tasks in the context of each person, of each client that I have online. I can bring all those resources that I have in my own experience and also in the experience of uh, the provisions that I know are available to bear upon an individual's journey through elderhood to make it real and to make it wonderful.
as Buzz said, to do with all the joy and passion and all of the enthusiasm that you've been experiencing it, not give in just to the malaise of, of an average, uh, succumb to the malaise of uh, the diminution of life. The first of those spiritual tasks, as they are presented, and Rob, would you put that up now? Uh, there are five spiritual tasks that I've identified, and this is just this is because I've worked with elders all my life and um, all my career. And uh, they don't necessarily go one by one, they don't necessarily go step by step in the but they do come in to our consciousness, and as they do, we re recognize that we are indeed in our elderhood. The elderhood's not a matter just of turning 65, in other words. It's a matter of being aware that this is what's happening in my life, and in my inner life, my inner consciousness. Grieving, sorting out, forgiving, preparing, and letting go. And I'd like to look at each of these in a little more depth uh, throughout the rest of the program today. Perhaps I can get in touch on grieving as we, uh, just before our break, we're going to have a break here in a minute, but <clears throat> um, some have said that aging is accumulating a series of losses accumulating a series of losses. When I was doing long-term care, I sat down in the, the lobby one day with uh, one of our residents sitting next to me, and I, I said, hello, Ruth, and she said, hello, Larry, and then she said, how old are you? I said, well, I'm 55, and she said, and I bet you're doing everything you can, possibly can, to stay healthy, right? I said, yeah, I'm eating well, I'm getting good exercise, I uh, take care of my body, yeah, I, I'm really doing everything I can to, to be well. And she said, why? Now, <clears throat> Ruth had been independent living up until the last year of that, before that day, and she uh, <clears throat> had been losing her sight and losing her ability to walk. She had been all through her life a very active young woman in um, uh, Colorado. She had been a part of evangelistic team, singing and dancing with her father and her siblings in northern Colorado. She had been so active in her elderhood uh, and very strongly involved in uh, her own personal care. But she'd lost her friends. She lost her family. She lost her, lost her, now was losing her legs and now was losing her sight. And so grief became part of her story and how she was moving every day through her life. Why are you taking care of yourself? <laughs> Why do you want to live to be 99? And she was expressing that grief. So we do experience this grief that comes up, and it becomes a, uh, a strong, strong force in our lives. Um, grieving... Um, it affects every relationship. It, it affects the way in which we uh, make decisions. It affects our, our daily lives, even, even how we sleep. We're going to take a, a minute break here, or take a break for a minute, and um, then I'll be right back with the other discussion of the rest of the task. Aloha. My name is Mark Schlav. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. My program airs every other Monday at one o'clock on Think Tech Hawaii. Most of my programs deal with my own life and law experience. Recently, I interviewed Alex Jempel, who I have known for over 30 years, about his voyage across the sea as a lawyer from Tokyo to Hawaii. Those are the type of stories that I like to bring and like to talk about, human stories about law and life. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Wendy Lowe, and I want you to join me as we take our health back. On my show, all we do is talk about things in everyday life, in Hawaii or abroad. I have guests on board that will just talk about different aspects of health in every, in every way, whether it's medical health, nutritional health, diabetic health, 
You name it, we'll talk about it. Even financial health, we'll even have some of the Miss Hawaii's on board and all the different topics that I feel will make your health and your lifestyle a lot better. So come join me. I welcome you to take your health back. Mahalo. Hello, welcome back to Elderhood, Aging Gracefully. I'm Larry Grimm, <coughs> a host of the show. And this show I've devoted to today's program to explaining the kind of the foundation by which I operate. I'm going to organize the show and I'm also going to I also organize my professional coaching for people online, one-on-one -on -one and group coaching. Focusing mostly on elderhood, those who find themselves in that time of life, which is really a special time of life, a unique time of life, an age at which, you know, we've never been this age before. <laughs> and especially we baby, baby boomers, um, we are part of what's called a silver tsunami. Uh, and that's a <clears throat> typical way of talking about it here in Hawaii, because we are, of course, right in the middle of the, uh, the Pacific Ocean. And it's always possible for us to feel, hear, have the effects of giant waves that will uh, affect our island life. <clears throat> so part of a silver tsunami, which means that we are part of that 260,000 uh, residents of Colorado, a fourth of the, I'm sorry, of Hawaii, a fourth of the Hawaii population that is 65 and over. But elderhood is not marked just by age. Elderhood's marked by the spiritual tasks that come up and require our attention. I've identified five spiritual tasks that seem to be prominent within this elderhood time of life. And they say to us, you've got to pay attention. And we, we don't always pay attention. They want our attention. And if we ignore them, then I think we do to ignore them to the detriment of our, of our experience. <clears throat> if we take them on and, and um, work with them and process them, these internal urgings and surgings, then we'll turn our life into something that's so um, glorious and meaningful. And um, I like to say real, <clears throat> real and wonderful. Before the break, I spoke about grieving, and grieving is uh, such a prominent feeling. Uh, it's an emotion that we have. We often discount it because, well, it's so common. We have to deal with it all the time, and we say, okay, I'm grieving. We don't even know that we're grieving, actually. We have a series of losses, and we sort of accept the fact that we've had these losses, and we're going to deal with them. And grief can come in the loss of, of, uh, of a capability, of, of an identity, uh, a job retirement. Retirement is not all that glorious because you can lose your sense of who you are uh, and have to re refigure that, reconfigure that. Uh, grieving can come uh, from the loss of a car, the loss of a, a child, the loss of a dog, the loss of a, a loving pet with whom you've had a strong bond. And the Rainbow Bridge is uh, a group that acknowledges how very, very strong the bonds are between people and their pets. And the loss of those pets can be bring, bring about a great deal of real, honest grief. I often say we grieve to the extent that we have loved. So if we've loved like this, we grieve like this. If we have loved like this, we grieve like this. It, it's kind of commensurate. So the second task is sorting out, I say. Now, people love to sort out their stuff at this age, right? Uh, you go go to the basement and you look at the stuff in the, in the basement or in the attic and you say, how did I accumulate all of this stuff? And when you begin sorting it out, you begin sorting out what you're going to keep, what you're going to give away, what you're going to pass along as an as a heirloom to others in your family, perhaps. But I maintain that the most important part of that is not the piece itself and the stuff itself, but the stories the stories that are attached to the stuff. <clears throat> now, you can have stories that are not attached to stuff, stories that you tell about yourself and about your past. The stories that you tell, when you tell them, are like remembering 
who you are, and how the event from the past helped to shape the person that you are right now. And the retelling of the story is a way of reliving that experience. I have my own stories that I tell, one of being assisting my daughter, second daughter's birth, both daughters, I was part of their birth. Very creative and wonderful experience as a father to be involved in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in their entrance into this world, into their coming forth into this world. Um, that says something about me right now. So we, we tell stories as a way about ourselves as a way of refusing to forget. Anamnesis is the Greek word, and it means not forgetting <clears throat> or remembrance. We say do things in remembrance, do this in remembrance. And it's a way of calling the past experience into the present with all of its meaning and significance and energy and energy. So we look at stories. We look at stories of who we are. You can even rewrite some of your stories, and that's an exercise that we can do in, uh, in the personal coaching. Third thing is forgiving. The third task is to forgive. <clears throat> now, I know that we often are think of religious injunctions that we have to forgive. Uh, Jesus talked about forgiving, almost compelled us to forgive. But what I'm finding is that this comes, no matter what religious background a person has, desire to forgive. Now, forgiving is different from reconciling. Reconciling means rebuilding a relationship, a relationship that's been broken in some way. Now, it may involve forgiving. It may be involve confronting and forgiving. But reconciliation takes more than one person. It takes a group or, a, or, or two people who want to rebuild um, to reestablish their goodness in their relationship. I think the Hawaiian action is ho'oponopono, which puts that goodness back in the relationship. Get us back to aloha, to sharing the love with one another. Uh, reconciliation means to refriend one, each other, re-counsel. And, and, that, and that, that can be done in elderhood. And, and sometimes face-to-face -face needs to be done if it's at all possible. But it takes both people being willing. Forgiveness, on the other hand, can be something that we unilaterally do. Forgiving another person who has offended you or me, forgiving another person um, that has held something uh, away from me uh, that I maybe think has been unjust or unrighteous. Um, conflict or disagreement that was never resolved, I can forgive. I can forgive that person. And that sets me free from the bonds of maintaining anger or a grudge or seeking vengeance. I find that people want to do this. They just want to have the slate clean as they come into this elderhood of time of their life. And uh, to do so, again, contributes to that, making that Elderhood real and wonderful. The, the fifth one is preparing. <clears throat> preparing uh, covers all, so much, of course. Now, there are the externals that we'll look at. We'll look at some externals. I want to interview some of the people in hospice care, um, Crystal Hospice, who are so good at assisting and lining up resources and dealing with the, uh, the, le the legalities of, um, of elder care, of, of connecting with the resources, of uh, identifying what needs to be done. Have you done your uh, uh, advanced directives? Have you planned for your funeral? Have you established clearly what kind of interventions you want to maintain your life? If you're in an accident or if you're severely damaged by a disease, <clears throat> there are tools out there that we'll look at that enable us to <clears throat> externally to prepare the way for <clears throat> that demise if it should happen when it when it will happen not if it should happen but when it will happen and um, and to set everybody's mind at ease but there is also an internal dimension to preparing and that is what do you imagine life will be like beyond death. 
Basically, there are four stories, four narratives about afterlife. <clears throat> One narrative is that the, the lights go out. The, the building shut down, you leave the building, the lights go out, and that's it. Uh, that's one belief in human, in human cultures. Second belief is that um, the body in some way will be resurrected or restored through reincarnation. The body becomes uh, revivified eventually and, uh, and, and continues on in eternity. The third is that we join our ancestors and the divine presence and we all gather together in celebration of con in our consciousness. The fourth is that we live on in our legacy that we leave here. In Kenya, there was a village that said, as long as someone in our village remembers you, you are alive. There's a kind of hope that our legacy, w which we will pass on in, in uh, the things that were valuable to us, not just things, but in the in terms of our spiritual life, our, in terms of our uh, commitments and values, we want to proceed and continue. So we'll look at some of that with the help of externals, uh, people who are very much involved, particularly from Bristol Hospice, who are involved in the caregiving, the look at the uh, dimensions of what's available to us when we need them and how to prepare. The last spiritual task is kind of somewhat tied in with the first. It's letting go. And many times I stood outside the door of a dying patient and the family member came out and said, you know, mom just won't let go. And I would say, yeah, I know it. But why would she want to? Why would any of us want to let go? It is a spiritual task to let go and we practice it many times up until our last breath when we let go of this body and this life this world in which we live. So there are two ways to come into elderhood. If you land a plane, I was in uh, the East Coast, Richmond, Virginia for a while. I flew into Asheville once. We were above the clouds, and the clouds were stormy over Asheville Airport. The pilot came on and said, okay, folks, uh, we're, we're flying above the storms. We're going to circle, circ, circ, um, we're going to just hang out here until I find an opening. He found an opening, and we dove down into the landing uh, and through the clouds to the landing. And we just, it was a white knuckle time for most of us. There's that kind of landing that we can do in our life as well into elderhood. Or we can come into Honolulu Airport, which is a nice long glide over the ocean and land gracefully. That's what I do with my elder care. That's what I do in personal, uh, personal uh, uh, coaching for life and faith. Thanks for joining me. Thank <laughs> you.